a human mind is a wandering mind and a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. The ability to think about what is not happening in a moment, I added the in a moment part, is a cognitive achievement that comes at an emotional cost. So I know I'm not alone in believing that this paper, A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind, and we will provide a link to this paper in the show note captions, is absolutely key in understanding why a meditation practice is so important. Because a meditation practice is really about adjusting your place along that interoceptive, exteroceptive continuum to what you happen to be experiencing in that moment. And while most people think of a meditative practice as focusing on what's going on internally with your eyes closed, third eye center, focusing on your breathing, et cetera, for any number of minutes or maybe even an hour or longer, there are other forms of meditation in which your exteroception dominates, in which you are actively focusing on things outside or beyond the confines of your skin and internal landscape. And that too is meditation. And if we are to take the work of Killingsworth and Gilbert, this a wandering mind is an unhappy mind, seriously, and I know a number of other laboratories have and have supported this research with their findings again and again and again, what this means is that meditating is not necessarily a practice that we do divorced from the rest of life. Meditation and mindfulness in particular, being present to what we are doing in a given moment is one of the essential keys to happiness and improved mood, even if what we are doing is unpleasant. So that brings us to a tool, and it's a tool that any and all of us can use, whether or not you tend to be interoceptively dominant, right? that you tend to pay more attention to your bodily sensations, or exteroceptively dominant. And again, if you don't know the answer to that question, there's a simple test that you can do. You can just sit down or lie down, close your eyes, and you can ask yourself or assess whether or not your attention tends to fleet to things outside of you, right? Cars honking or going by, people in the room, or whether or not you tend to be able to focus on your internal landscape to the exclusion of exteroception and attention to things outside the confines of your skin easily. Now, of course, this will depend on context and situation, even how well rested you are, et cetera, but that's exactly the point. This is the sort of thing you want to do every time you decide to do a meditation practice. In fact, I would suggest that you use this to determine what meditation you do at any given moment. So let's say you are somebody who is a regular meditator, or let's say you're somebody who's never meditated and you'd like to develop a meditation practice. I suggest that you do a test of whether or not you are more interoceptively dominant or exteroceptively dominant in that moment. Okay, this Again, this is not a personality trait. This is a question about where you happen to be in a moment. So let's say you're on a plane or you're in the car. If you're in the car, please don't close your eyes while driving. That's sort of obvious, but do this in a safe way, please. But stop, close your eyes and assess whether or not you can access and focus your attention primarily on your internal state or whether or not your attention and perception gets pulled to something external, to exteroception. And again, that will vary depending on circumstance and who you are. Then I suggest opening your eyes and trying to focus your attention to something external to you and seeing or evaluating the extent to which you can divorce your perception from sensations that occur at the level of your skin or internally. Now, I should say that there's no technology, at least not that I'm aware of, absence of fMRI machine, in which case you are inside an fMRI machine while you do this. But unless you are in that experiment, and most of us aren't, there's no technology that can tell you, for instance, whether or not you are interoceptively dominant or exteroceptively dominant, and whether or not the ratio is you know 75 to 25 or what have you at any given moment. You have to assess this subjectively. However, if you sit down, for instance, and you notice that you can equally split your attention between internal sensations and external sensations, or whether or not you find yourself pulled into external sensations when you're trying to focus inward, or you find yourself pulled inward when you're trying to focus outward, well, that will dictate the sort of meditation that you perhaps ought to perform in that moment. Let me give an example of how you would do this. You would stop in some way, so sit or lie down, close your eyes, and evaluate whether or not you can essentially rule out or eliminate attention to all outside events. 
Most people won't be able to do that entirely, but try and focus your attention, for instance, on your breathing or the typical third eye center, you know, focusing at a spot right behind your forehead. If you feel you can do that reasonably well to the exclusion of what's happening around you, well then an important question arises. Should you meditate in a way to enhance that interoceptive awareness? Or rather, should you meditate in a way, for instance, with your eyes open and your attention on a particular portion of the landscape you're in, like a tree or or maybe even a, uh, you know, an object or a plant or something else in your immediate environment to try and cultivate or enhance your exteroceptive awareness. That's up to you, but my bias would be one in which you work against your default state. Again, the default mode network is where you land on this interoceptive, exteroceptive continuum is going to lead to more mind wandering. Whereas when you encourage, or we could even say force yourself a little bit to anchor your attention to either inside your body or outside your body, and you make that decision according to what you are doing less easily, well then you are actively training up the neural circuits. You are engaging so-called neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change in response to experience. You are deliberately engaging a shift along that continuum. To make this crystal clear, what I mean is this. Let me give an example. If I were to sit down and I want to do some meditation, let's just say three minutes of meditation. There's good evidence that even three minutes of meditation can be beneficial for a variety of things, including enhanced focus and enhanced anxiety management. But let's say I sit down and I notice that I can really focus inward on what's happening at the level of my skin and my internal organs and I can rule out everything. Maybe that's because the room is quiet or maybe it's just because my brain is in a state that I'm particularly good at that at that moment. Or maybe it's just a natural ability. Well, then I would opt for a three minute meditation practice in which I deliberately exterocept that I build up the circuitry to focus on something external to me because I want, and I think most people would like to have an adaptive mechanism within them so that they can slide along that continuum and they don't default to whatever it happens to be easiest for them in that moment. Now, if I were to sit down and try and focus on what's going on internally, and I kept getting distracted by things happening outside of me, opening my eyes or feeling like I need to reach for my phone or paying attention to the sounds in the room, well, then I would actively engage a meditation practice, in this case, a three minute example, but it could be longer, where I'm deliberately trying to focus my perception on events at the level of the confines of my skin and internally. Why do I say this? Well, you know, I love to use the phrase uh, anytime with kids, uh, you know, when they say this is really hard or something's challenging or adults will say that's really tough. Well, as my graduate advisor used to say, that means you're learning. If something were easy, if you can perform any activity or thought, et cetera, well, then there is absolutely zero reason for your neural circuits to change. It's the friction, it's the feeling that something is hard that turns on the enormous variety of mechanisms at the level of cells, et cetera, that allow you to potentially change your neural circuitry. So challenge and discomfort is the signal to your brain and body that something needs to change. So I'm encouraging you to embark on meditative practices that are not your default. Okay, to essentially go against the grain of where your interoceptive bias or your extraoceptive bias happens to be at a given moment. And again, this will change. For some of you, this will change across the day where early in the day you are very, very good at doing an interoceptive biased meditation and later in the day you aren't. I actually believe based on the data that I've covered and we'll get into a few more papers about this and my lab is actively working on this as well, that a meditative practice can be made far more effective. That is, it can invoke more neuroplasticity, more shift in brain states and brain circuitry if we do not take the easy path. That is, we go against the grain of what our brain would naturally do in a given moment. So if you're in a crowded airport and you're finding that everything's very distracting, well then, that would be a great time to do some interoceptive focused meditation. Whereas if you are really in your head, you know, you're looping thoughts about the past and present, maybe you're even an obsessive thought. Well, that would be a terrific time, an ideal time really, to do a short meditation focused on something external to you. In both cases, whether or not you're focused on interoceptive bias or extraoceptive bias, you are going against, or I should say you're pushing back against your default mode network. I would argue it's going to be far more effective 
That is, you're going to reduce or shift the activity of that default mode network far more and in a far more beneficial way if you actively try and suppress your bias toward being more interoceptive or exteroceptive. Now, I think that's immensely beneficial both for the immediate changes that you experience, what others have called a state change, because that's what it is. And it also can lead to, as we referred to earlier, more neuroplasticity, more changes in the brain circuits that underlie your default mode network and lead to what are called trait changes. And I wanna be very clear that I am not the first to make this state versus trait distinction. That's a distinction that was raised in a really wonderful book. In fact, I can't recommend this book highly enough. The book is Altered Traits, Science Reveals How Meditation Changes Your Mind, Brain, and Body. This is a book by Daniel Goleman and uh, Richard Davidson. They've done uh, terrific work and many writings and many TED Talks, et cetera, about meditation. I would say that circa 2016, 2017, this book really captured what I believe to be the, the most essential elements of the science of meditation and a lot of the history of it as well. Today, we're focusing on much of what's covered in this book, but also a lot of things that have hap happened Excuse me, since 2017. In fact, most of the papers that I'm going to talk about are papers that were published after 2017. But again, there's a wonderful book where they very clearly distinguish between state changes and trait changes, trait changes being the more long-lasting ones. My read of this book and the literature that follows is, again, that when you sit down to meditate, it is going to be most effective to do that interoceptive, extraoceptive bias assessment. Ask yourself whether or not you are more in your head or outside your head, if you will. And then to do a meditation practice that runs counter to where you happen to be at. That is, that pushes you more externally if you're in your head. And if you're more focused on what's going on around you, that pushes you more internally. Now, I think most people are familiar with how to do an interoceptive biased meditation. Again, that would be setting a timer. Maybe you don't even set a timer. You just sit or lie down, close your eyes, focus on that third eye center behind your forehead or focus on your breathing or your bodily sensations. That's typical and often discussed. Exteroceptive based meditations, you pick a focal point outside or beyond the confines of your skin. So that could be, for instance, a point on the wall if you are indoors, it could be a plant, it could be a point on the horizon far away. What you will find is that your visual system will fatigue a little bit when you concentrate your visual focus at that location. I wanna remind you that it is perfectly okay and in fact, necessary to blink. So you should blink, you can relax your face, you can change your expression. There is no rule that says that you can't do those things. This is not you know, just beaming uh, a particular location in space and holding your eyelids open. I've been accused many times of not blinking very often. That's for other reasons. It's part of the way I access um, memory about what I want to say. I don't use a prompter here. So I'm accessing from a sort of in internal um, image in my head. Uh, that's how my memory works. But in any case, if you're going to do an extraoceptive biased meditation, there is absolutely no reason why you wouldn't look away from that location every once in a while. In the same way that if you're focused on internal thoughts with your eyes closed and focused on your breathing, every once in a while, your thoughts will skip away from that breathing or from your third eye center. In fact, and this is discussed in the book Altered Traits, but by many other people as well, one of the key elements of any meditative practice, whether or not it's interoceptively focused or exteroceptively focused, is that it's really a refocusing practice. The more number of times that you have to yank yourself back into attending or perceiving one specific thing. In other words, the more times your mind wanders and you bring it back, actually the more effective that practice is. Again, if you can just focus on one location with laser precision and your mind never darts away from that and you don't have to bring it back, well then there's no neuroplasticity. Nothing needs to change because your nervous system will effectively know it's performing perfectly. So if you're somebody who tries to do meditation, you find that your mind just wanders, just remember every time you scruff yourself and pull yourself back to focusing on some location externally or focus back on your breath or your third eye center, each one of those are just opportunities to do better. They are essential to the improvement process. Think about them as ascending a staircase of refocusing. Every time you refocus, you're going up one more level, another stair, another stair, another stair. And I think that will move you away from the kind of judgmental process of thinking, oh, like I can't focus on anything. Pretty soon, what you'll notice is that 
the refocusing process will happen so quickly that you don't even perceive it. And again, this is something that's borne out in the neuroimaging data. A lot of people think that they can focus with laser precision, but actually what they are better at doing is refocusing more quickly and consistently over time. There's a classic study about this in very experienced meditators that was done in Japan where they had people with varying levels of meditation ability. So some who had never meditated, others who are really expert meditators with many hundreds, if not thousands of hours of meditation under their belt. And they had those people listen to 20 tones repeated over and over the same tone. And they found that the expert meditators could really focus, and they did this by brain imaging, they could really focus on all 20 tones, whereas most people kind of attenuate or what's called habituate to the tone so that by the 10th or 11th tone, their mind is really going to something else. Now, that's wonderful, but that really just tells us that expert meditators have better focus. But it turns out that the more modern neuroimaging studies have shown that they don't have better focus such that they're staying in a very narrow trench of focus. What they're doing is they're exiting focus and going back in more quickly, more quickly, more quickly, over and over again. So rather than think about your ability to focus, think about your ability to refocus. And the more number of times you have to refocus, the better training you're getting. So earlier I mentioned doing this interoceptive biased or extraoceptive biased meditation for three minutes. Why did I say three minutes? Well, three minutes seems like a reasonable number for most people to do consistently, you know, once a day. And in fact, there are some studies of one minute meditations and three minute meditations and 10 and 60. My laboratory has been studying a five minute a day meditation and that clearly has benefits. But I think it's also clear that by three minutes, many of the benefits are starting to arrive. And so while I'm not pointing to any one particular data point here, it's very clear that forcing oneself to direct one's perception, that is your attention, to your internal state or to something external to you is immensely beneficial if you do it consistently and is, again, especially beneficial if you're focusing your attention on the portion of your experience, either internal or external to you, that is not the one that you would default to in that moment.